Thank you for joining the webinar this morning. Um, today we'll be talking about the reasons why, or the six reasons why businesses don't sell. You'll all see from my LinkedIn profile that I put a post out recently about um, the lessons to be learned when businesses don't sell. The completions are great, we all celebrate them, uh, and we should. We should definitely be celebrating them in today's world, but there's always a lesson to be learned from failure. And Rob and I will be discuss discussing these with you as we go along. We have a question and answer session at the end for those of you who wish to ask any uh, technical questions of Rob and I, and you may well get some secrets. Now, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joined today by Rob, who is chairman of Evolution CBS. Uh, I've known Rob for over 15 years, and for those of you who would say that you get less for a serious criminal offence, you'd be right. I'll let Rob, I'll let Rob comment on that. Uh, um, without further ado, over to Mr. Goddard. Yeah, thank you for that setup, Govey. It's <laughs> been a lot of years, hasn't it? <laughs> Enjoyable. I, do you know, I've always said with lawyers, um, you don't buy the law firm, you buy the lawyer. And, uh, and, and that, I mean, that's not just true of the legal profession. That's true of maybe accountancy and other professions. Um, but uh, it's the person, isn't it? Yes. That you do business with. It's the relationship you have with the person. So, yeah, 15 years we've been doing deals together. <laughs> you on the legal side, uh, me on the, uh, on the side of finding buyers, potential buyers, acquirers, investors for my clients' businesses. And uh, I spent 20 years in mergers and acquisitions. Um, and I've been responsible for currently 356 successful transactions over those two decades. Um, the next one coming up, and I think it's in your firm's, oh, it's your hands actually, Cuffy. It is. It is. I'm it's, glad you mentioned uh, it, Rob. Yeah. No, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Um, uh, so three, three, 357, uh, hopefully over the next few weeks, because it's on the back end of due diligence. So uh, I think I, I've, I've learned in business. Um, in the last 40 years, gradually I've learned that the more you open up and give and, and perhaps make yourself a little bit vulnerable, yeah. maybe a bit authentic as well, then actually people gravitate towards that. People like authenticity. They like a bit of humanness because people yes. buy people first, we know. Yes. So um, I'm looking forward to, you're right, sharing some secrets because why should we keep them to ourselves, why don't we help others there that are listening and watching this today to help give them some food for thought, a steer for the future, maybe. I'm very happy to take live Q&A questions, um, try to respond really to anything that might come up. If you've got a burning question, pop it in the Q&A board at the bottom of your screen and we'll, uh, we'll monitor that between us. And we'll make sure that in our time together that we answer that. And if we don't answer that fully for you, let us know on the Q&A. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll recircle round. So it would be a good time, Govey, just to sort of crack on with some yes. of the, the, the most common pitfalls. Is yeah. that helpful? Yes, yes. So um, there's, there's dozens, aren't there? And, uh, and I've picked the top six based on those... 300 plus successful transactions because sadly I haven't uh, got a hundred percent record only just under 80 percent over that time <laughs> but I, I want to concentrate on the 20 percent in my career that I haven't managed to get over the line because I think there's some real learnings for the audience yeah. um, particularly for business owners that are contemplating a sale at some point because if you if you have the knowledge now, you may be able to do, hopefully, be able to implement things going forward that will help your transaction become a smooth transaction or smoother <laughs> than would have been and, and sell first time. Because why waste money and time and effort and heartache on a transaction that doesn't complete uh, at the end? So the first one's actually a personal one. Uh, the first of the six most common uh, reasons a deal doesn't complete and it's personal and I speak as a fellow owner manager um, who started a business with no startup capital 12 years ago um, it's and, and nurtured the business grown it into a multi-million pound international business and I also am a 
non-exec for several other businesses and mentor. And I do have sufficient time left in the week to work with a couple of charities, one involved in the, uh, the cancer field and the other one as an orphanage overseas. Yeah. So um, I think the, the personal one is actually the, the, the key barrier to selling a business is actually the seller, the owner manager letting go. Which sounds bizarre, doesn't it, Gavi? <laughs> yeah, it's odd. I mean, it's, I'm glad you talked about that, Rob. And I've, I've got a personal one too, which I'll come on to shortly. But on my, I've got, um, quite ironically, I've got five P's and one C, which are my six, <laughs> six topics. <laughs> and you talk about, uh, and one of them is people. And um, a lot of mine, and I'm sure yours will too, Rob, they are interrelated. So once a seller is in the sale process, there's a mindset change. Now, and it's very difficult and there are three key elements that mindset change the first is i'm now uh, giving away the crown jewels okay because you've you know you've raised you know, you know you've built this business most of the people we uh, act for rob uh, aren't repeat offenders so they're only going to sell once and there's a key challenge to this and time is a very big influencer because once you've made the decision to sell then you must also remember that you're still running a business and you might get, you know, you might see the yacht at the end of the tunnel. You might see the Ferrari, you might see the mortgage paid off, but the key is to remember that you're always still running your business. And until the money's in the bank, you haven't sold your business. And the key is you are also, and I, I talked about psychology a second ago, you now have a mix of people that may never normally have met. You know, you're talking to somebody most of the time, and I'm sure you've got the percentages, Rob, most of the time you'll find, and I suspect it will be even more so now, is that you will find a buyer that isn't in your sector. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, Complimentary. And you, and you will find that your paths haven't crossed. So now you've got two key to two points. Um, you're talking to people you never normally would have met. You don't know them. You're getting to know them and you're handing over the crown jewels. So yes, Rob, you're absolutely right. It's the seller who can, under some circumstances, be, for want of better words, an obstacle to the, to the process itself. Yeah, I, I definitely underline that. And um, whilst we, have a, we sell almost four out of five transactions first time, the industry isn't like that. The industry is actually the reverse. You'd be lucky in the industry uh, to have a one in five chance of selling your business. And I mean, that's a shocking statistic. Um, and it's, it's, it's a combination of factors because various studies have happened uh, to understand why this is the case. One of the reasons is such a low conversion rate is business owners changing their mind about selling their business. They're Absolutely. letting go. Absolutely. And, and, and you think, well, it's bizarre, isn't it? Because surely they want the three million quid. You know, they've, they've spent... 20, 30 years Absolutely. building a, a, a business yeah. Yeah. for a capital exit. And they, they engage people like you and me. They pay money, they spend time. And then it's usually at the back end, I found, Guffy, um, that they change their mind. And they don't, <clears throat> what they say to me uh, is, look, Rob, I, I, you know, your, your team's done a great job and we've got some great offers in. Um, but do you know what? I, th I think we'll, we'll take it off the market and we'll remarket it in a couple of years' time. Obviously, we're going to uh, reinstruct you. We'll come back to you in a couple of years' time because um, we want to grow the business. So, John, Janet, are you scared? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what are you frightened of? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. when, when we first started this process, that you said you'd be happy uh, for one and a half million. Um, two, you'd be delighted, and we've got you 3.4 million, and now, and, and now you're pulling out. Yeah, and, and now you've gone from, oh, we're tired, Govy. we've gone from entrepreneurs to managers. <laughs> you know, I don't like the HR element of it. I, I loved growing it from the start. I loved the risk-taking. Yeah. I loved the negotiation. And, you know, Rob, you and I both heard it, and we're tired now, Govy. and we're tired you know, and we just want to see the fruits of our labor. We don't want the, you know, we don't want the red tape anymore. And we don't want to be managers, you know. And so I've had it equally uh, as, as pernicious as that, Rob, in the sense that, you know, I did a deal about 
six months ago and I got a phone call and we were selling for over 10 million and I got a phone call on the morning of completion from the seller. You know, the, everything had been agreed and the seller said, look, I'm not sure about this, Gubby. And whenever you hear that, in my experience, on the morning of completion, <laughs> it goes into psychology because now, and um, you'll see from my LinkedIn post, Rob, I'm a voracious reader and there's something called the endowment effect that they have something and now they have to let go. And it doesn't matter because I'm letting go of something. You know, it's the same if I, if I gave you a mug that's worth four pounds for argument's sake, and a day later I said, Rob, can I have that mug back? Your immediate effect would be, oh, look, it's mine. Immediate, immediate. You, you, you'll say that's fine over time, but your immediate psychological reaction is, that's my mug. What, what, and, be, and because there's a lag, you know, between the, the celebration of completion and the cash in the bank, some sellers don't see that. They just see, well, and equally they go, well, Rob, um, I know you and Govey have done a great job, but tomorrow morning I have to go to work at nine o'clock, yes? And then I have to take an hour for lunch, yes? And I've got a reporting line, yes? And, and I have to, I can't leave before 5.30, no? Well, hang on a second. <laughs> what do you mean? And it's five days a week, yeah? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, see that what that says to me govy is that selling a business isn't ultimately a financial transaction because mm. it ain't about the money mm. what it is is an emotional transaction when you strip it down and if i cover it in my book whoop, the seven commandment or the 11 commandments and the seven cardinal sins of selling a business i know you've read it because you're as you say you're a voracious reader and there's a I there's a free copy. copy rob i'm one of the few who have a signed <laughs> copy so for those of you who are attending this webinar <laughs> If you sign up and let Rob know, he'll sign them for you. And not many people have that. <laughs> It'll only take you an evening to read it because I write thin books, <laughs> uh, partly because I'm dyslexic and I, I have challenges with numbers as well. Um, <laughs> that's why I couldn't stay in banking. <laughs> <I could, laughs> oh dear. So the top tip then under that, that first barrier to selling and, and the letting go is think about life after sale. So before you even instruct someone like us or Govey, think about what is the life that you want? If it's all the things, the negative things that Govey has just mentioned, you know, you want to get away from all those things that Govey listed and you want a different life and have the capital to then fulfill that life. What is it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And then discuss it with the people closest to you. And, and plan what life like, looks like after sale. If you don't do that and you just go into a transaction to sell the business, you are highly likely to pull out much the consternation of me, Govey, the buyer who's wa wasted all their time and their lawyers and PwC, their auditors. Don't, and, uh, just don't do it. And that, that's one of the reasons why there's such a low conversion rate in the industry. And it's why we have a, such a high conversion rate in evolution, because we have this honest conversation in uh, forums like this. So that's, that's the first one. The, the second uh, deal breaker, and uh, it, it accounts for, probably in, in our experience, over half of the deals not completing is one thing. And that's a lack of financial rigor and reporting. And uh, it, come, it can come up, it often comes up in due diligence where the accounts, because I, I used to think, even as a bank manager, that accounts were sacrosanct and were true. But of course, accounts can be interpreted and they yep. can be positioned in, in different ways. So um, these things and stuff that you've done in the past, maybe with good intention, and um, particularly with your accountant, may unravel in the process of selling the business. So if you haven't got management accounts, if you don't have statutory accounts, and if you're over a certain level, audited accounts, get them done. Uh, we, we don't take on businesses that don't have the proper financial reporting in place it's a waste of our time and our clients time and money so financial rig or the lack of financial rigor because what happens is when that if that comes up the buyer is immediately going to chip you on price that that original offer is coming down 
yeah. because the numbers don't stack up. Um, also allied to that, and, and uh, hopefully you won't smile too much, Govey, is um, unorthodox accounting procedures. I think that's the nice way of putting it. That's very diplomatic of you, Rob. <laughs> I don't want to get sued. <laughs> uh, right, I, I've, I've also heard it another way. Maybe you have too, Govey. Um, tax mitigation. Yes. So it, it's a spectrum, isn't it? So there's definitely things that are lawful in terms of mitigating tax, and why wouldn't we? want to mitigate tax. Um, but there is a dividing line between what's legal and what is not legal. Quite. There's always and, a, um, a difference between, and this, this, um, the distinction's getting blurred, and, it, and I'll talk about it in a second, between evasion and avoidance. Now, go for it. Yeah, go for it. There, historically, and I, and I repeat the word historically, avoidance was frowned upon but not, not necessarily, you never, not, not re didn't really get a knock on the door. But evasion was uh, more than a scowl, shall we say, and you'll get a knock on the door. Now, um, in today's world, uh, and, and I'm not going to bore you with the legislation, but there's a general catch all that the revenue have, and uh, the distinction is blurred. And for those of you watching the webinar and looking at this following uh, the recording, if you have historically undertaken anything that you think, well, um, what would I look at? How would I look at this if I were the buyer? Okay. And that's the angle I, I look at when I'm doing the legals with clients. If I was acting on the buy side, how would I interpret this? And when I speak to accountants, it's all very well that historically it's always been done this way. But <laughs> if it has, if there's a scheme, and then I'm going to give a particular example, if you've done an EBT, again, I'm not going to bore you with the technicals, but if you had an EBT scheme in place, you must now make sure that they are, for want of better words, cleaned, because it goes back to my earlier point, Rob. It's about the accounting, but it's also about the psychology, because if the buyer says, oh, you've done this, well, what else have you done? Then what else have you done? Then a little bit wider than that, um, and I'm going to, uh, for those of you who are on and are accountants, I'm very sorry, uh, but... Uh, buyers accountants are on a bound uh, to find a problem in the sense that if you are a buyer and your accountant comes to you and says actually this company is amazing there's no problem with this here's my bill for fifty thousand pounds please the buyer's going to go hang on you've just brought a bill for me to tell me it's okay that was my assumption anyway otherwise i won't be buying the company but if the buyer's accountant says uh, there's an ebt here i've just saved you two hundred thousand pounds by a price chip then, and here's my bill for 50, the psychology changes. So yeah. uh, to go back to your point, if uh, there are any schemes where if you as a seller put your buyer's hat on and said, well, would I buy the company with this? No, I wouldn't. Now is the time to make sure that they are all settled and cleaned before, and I use clean in the pejorative, uh, before you get to market, because when you're at market, it's normally too late. And a buyer will say, as I, and I repeat, mentioned a second ago, if this is in place, what else is there? What else is there? What else is there? And it makes your job, Rob, harder. You know, you've got a great team. I've worked with Steve and Mike for years, but it's hard for them because there's negotiation and there's a point at which it's not about negotiation because you will get a comment from the buyer, Rob, Steve, Mike, this is in place. How do we handle this? And you can't negotiate. Yeah. No, I, look, I totally agree with you. And it's not just unorthodox accountancy procedures <laughs> uh, yeah. in the past. It's also um, buyers buy on future potential. They don't buy historic accounts, although they, they will use it if they're savvy against you um, to chip on price. But what they're really buying is the future potential of the business. So not only have you got to have financially robust uh, past accounts, historical accounts, you need management accounts that are realistic and that you're going to achieve your year end. Because if you don't achieve it, your year end forecast or exceed it, you're, we're immediately on the back foot in a negotiation because you haven't achieved your numbers this year and you want to sell the business. And you can't say, trust me, it'll all be put right next year once you've bought my shares. <laughs> Trust me, I wouldn't lie. Yeah. <laughs> um, they don't. So, um, and also they want to know, the buyer wants to know the next two, three years financial forecast. So if you're not in the habit of forecasting, you better learn quick as a right. business owner. Because right. so, right. you've got to paint a picture with some numbers attached as to what the future looks like.
and what the future might look like without you at the helm because you've sold up. So I, 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 another top tip to um, underline what Govy's given is if your accountant is out of their depth, if you appointed 30 years ago the village accountant and you've kept with them, because people tend to, tend to keep their accountant or their bank manager, yeah. um, and you've grown the business, but your business has outgrown your accountant, change them. That's my top tip. Find an accountant or accountancy firm that are commensurate with the business that you've got today. Because when you sit in front of the buy side team in the due diligence uh, meetings, and they've got PwC the other side, who will be, and Gavi is right, that they'll, they'll be charging uh, quite a lot of money to their client on the other side. They're gonna, and they're incentivized to try and find ways of getting the price down. Make sure your accountant is up to the mark. So I'll leave that one hanging there. The third, the third deal breaker, I don't expect Gavi to comment on this because it's about his industry. <laughs> and I'm what, sure what that... I presume you're going to say. <laughs> I'm sure that your managing partner will be listening to this as well. <laughs> <laughs> no comment, Rob. No comment. <laughs> um, third deal breaker is picking the wrong lawyer or, or law firm, but particularly the lawyer. And what I mean that, I don't mean that some lawyers don't know the law, technically because they all should do and they do i don't mean that i mean picking the wrong lawyer because they're not pragmatic and they're not good at negotiating and this is why we use companies like mackerels to refer our clients to because mackerels have a history and and the people and govy is one of that team that are pragmatic they know the law they know the commercial law they know how to go through the process because they're experienced at it but more than that they know how to negotiate because often you can you can agree the headline terms and and basic deal structure but the devil is in the detail and if you've got a lawyer particularly if they're charging by the hour um if you've got a lawyer that wants to score points against the other law firm on the other side you've got a problem because this deal is going to extend and extend and extend and uh, it could be a very big legal bill for you. And what often happens in situations like that is something called deal fatigue sets in. One of the parties withdraws from the transaction, the, either the buyer or the seller, because do you know what? They're just fed up. They'd rather get on with life. And it can be the seller as much as the buyer. And in those circumstances that I'm describing, it's the lawyer or both lawyers on both sides um, getting involved in arguments. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Rob. And I think you, you've got to remember that um, a couple of stories here. I, I, did a, I undertook a sale about a year ago when I was introduced uh, to the sellers and the seller said, well, hang on a second, Govy. Um, why should we use you? We, we'd like to use our current solicitor. I said, it's absolutely fine by me. Uh, and I wish you all the best. I said, I'd like to ask you some questions. Uh, you know, what's the pedigree of the lawyer? You know, how, how, how many transactions have they undertaken? Well, you know, it's a lawyer that is, has done my will. It's the lawyer that bought my house for me. And okay, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and, you know, I, I would take my hat off because I don't know anything about wills, or anything about property law. We, we've got a great department at Macro for every single discipline. But if you're talking about corporate, how many transactions has your solicitor undertaken? Well, none. Okay. And I've undertaken deals where I've had conveyancing lawyers on the other side. I'm not, you know, I'm not taking this away, but you have to remember just because you're a lawyer, you have to test the discipline. And there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, and again, I, I talk a lot about psychology because if as a human being, you don't know something, your immediate reaction is the shutters go up. I don't know this. So the answer is no. Okay. And it makes life harder. Because when we were acting on the sell side and we had a conveyancing law on the buy side, we had no to everything. There was no movement. Okay. So it took longer and longer and longer. Okay. And you're absolutely right, Rob. Deal fatigue set, started to creep in and we had to have an all parties meeting, which didn't, we didn't need to have because it would have been quite pragmatic and efficient to do it electronically, but we had to have the meeting. So you have to explain your position. Now it took longer because I had to tell the buy side what, why we wanted what we wanted. And eventually we got there. And the opposite of that is when you have two corporate lawyers on, on each side, it makes life much easier. And 
a current transaction I'm undertaking at the moment. You won't be very happy about this, Rob. It isn't one of your sales, but um, I've got... I, I feel spurned. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we have a law firm on the other side that I've done a deal with in the past. So what happens? You pick up the phone and you say, how are you? And you have uh, the pleasantries, but equally you set the scene and you say, this is how you and I behave in the last transaction. So can we behave like this on this transaction? Now, I'm not saying you agree the same uh, risk parameters because every deal is different, but it's the psychological approach to that deal that you must have. And which is why it's very important to have corporate lawyers on both sides of the transaction because it creates problems for everybody. You know, the sell side, the buy side. And it's very important to do that in today's world because if you are selling a company and you've got this pandemic, it's already creating fear. It's already creating fatigue. So you have to make sure the team around you understands what's relevant and what isn't. And an example of that is uh, just last week, I closed a transaction and I was asked to give all, well, the sellers were asked to give a, sh a complete sheet of warranties and we'll look at warranties at the end uh, about stock and reams and reams, Rob. You know, the stock in trade is valuable. And I said, you can have all of them. And the buy side lawyer said, well, don't you want to negotiate any of these? I said, no, not particularly, given that we're selling you a consultancy company and it hasn't got any stock. And he said, oh, that's fine. Okay. So you have to know what's relevant and what isn't. Yeah. Pragmatic lawyers, you wouldn't go far wrong with macros. I can say that because we know lawyers are very humble and, and self-effacing. <laughs> So that, that's, that's uh, the third deal breaker. The fourth one uh, is funding issues from the buyer. Now, I, I, I've got two comments to make on this whole topic on buyers. Uh, number one, with buyer funding, there, there seems to be this phenomenon, certainly in, on social media in the last few years, buy a business for a pound. Well, I can assure you, no one buys a business for a pound. None of my clients sell for a pound. Um, I'm sure it must go on. It's not a world I occupy at all. Never have in 20 years. I, I'm, I, I suspect it's distressed businesses. And even you might buy a business for a pound, but uh, typically with a distress sale, you're going to pick up some liabilities as well, uh, like payroll this month, yeah. like VAT, like maybe there's some debt in there, supplier debt. Yeah. So... Um, Beware, is, is my comment on that. Beware of um, these uh, masterclasses, training, um, courses about how to buy a business for a pound. It's not a world I'm familiar with. I'm sh I, I'm, I am aware that it goes on, but it's not a world that I occupy, nor, nor do I want to. So that's the first thing. Um, and of course, the, the reason, sometimes we come across it in our world because we have a phone call or an email from someone purporting to be an acquirer and want to buy a business, well, we're very good at weeding those out if they haven't got any money. I mean, I'd love a Lamborghini Hurricane. But I... I <laughs> in fact, I think you might have seen the post on LinkedIn a few months ago, Guffy. Um, I was looking for a, another car, and I was looking at a nine, Porsche 911, um, but my, my eye was drawn to a Ferrari, gleaming in red, and it was, it was, it was 90 grand. So uh, second-hand Ferrari, obviously, at that price. Yep. Um, so I, I spoke to the sales guy and said, could I buy that Ferrari for a pound? <laughs> <laughs> and then if it appreciates in value, which it surely will, then I'll, I'll agree to pay some deferred payment to you so you don't lose out in future years. We, sh we share the risk together. And <laughs> he looked a rather stunned. <laughs> that I'd offered to buy a Ferrari for a pound. And he said, well, you could do, actually, sir. Um, we do have a special lease scheme where you could put a pound deposit down and then over the next two years, <laughs> you can pay the remaining £89,999 at 12.4% interest. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, that's the first thing. If you approached, if you've got a business and you're looking to sell, or maybe you're not expecting to sell, but you get a call out of the blue, please check in that first phone call that they've got the money. We do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a complete waste of time the other aspect the second thing is there is this new phenomenon of people calling purporting to have a private equity fund N no they don't some of these people 
what they mean is they're a private individual that might may or may not have access to external cash that's not my knowledge and understanding of private equity who have already got a fund already got their investors on board yeah, yeah. so beware of those people picking up the phone calling you out of the blue so yeah by funding issues it wastes so much time you need to be so attuned to make sure in in that opening call or conversation and, and what are your thoughts on that, Gavi? Do you come across that? All, all the time, Rob. I think the, the key is, and you've hit the nail on the head, you know, you wouldn't, and again, I'm going to use the crown jewels as an example. You, know, you wouldn't give away your crown jewels for um, a pound and expect to be paid for them later. You know, you, and again, you've worked so hard to build your business and, uh, and it's distress sales that would, would be probably sold for a pound. But the challenge, of course, is they're laden with debt. So as yeah. soon as you bought that company, you're going to have the revenue knocking the door. Excuse me, payroll is late. Excuse me, VAT is late. National insurance is late. Your corporation tax is late. And you've got the bank knocking the door. Uh, the company owes us, you know, £700,000. Now, that's all very well. You're saying you bought it for a pound. But do you really want the emotional stress of having to clear the debt? So I come across it all the time. Uh, the... The other, and a little bit wider than that, is whenever you're selling your company and it's entirely normal to agree that some of the consideration will be paid later, and I, I use a technical, uh, technical term consideration, we just mean the price, you've got to be sure that that credit risk is managed. You know, to contextualize that, you might be selling your company for three million and you've agreed that you'll take two million on day one and you'll wait a year later for a million pounds. So you have to test that. You know, are they buying with a new company? If they're buying your company with a newly set up company, how are you managing that credit risk? And that doesn't mean that you have to ask for security all of the time. You know, I'm going back to my earlier example. I'm selling a company to a major PLC and we are getting paid later, but we're not going to ask for security because there's so much money in the bank. And the PLC is very, very well known. And the risk of them defaulting for the amount that's involved is low because of one, the reputational risk of this PLC buys businesses, doesn't pay what it's owed. Well, that'll spook the investors behind it. And secondly, it's going to be an expensive battle because they use very, very expensive lawyers. So yeah, I've come across it uh, mm. a lot, Rob, but that doesn't mean in the sense that if you're selling, you should always manage the credit risk if you're getting paid later. Yeah, I, I, I say the, the Romans 2000 years ago had an expression for it, didn't they? I don't know what it is in Latin, but it is definitely buyer beware. Caveat in. <laughs> or beware of the buyer. Beware of the buyer. <laughs> I'll just reverse the Latin grammar. <laughs> and beware of the buyer if you're the seller. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that's number four. Um, five and six, um, so as we enter the final straight on this, are actually very related because of the to, to do with price. Um, number five, big deal breaker, common deal breaker, is shareholders in the selling company I'm talking about specifically, not being aligned. And I've always said the, the, the more shareholders there are, the less likely the transaction is to ever go ahead. The highest, in the last 20 years, the most I've ever been uh, faced with is 48 shareholders, would you believe, Govey? 48. <laughs> and they had this like subcommittee of six that were supposed yeah, to speak yeah. for the other 42. <laughs> I presume did, did all was the sale price forty eight million, giving her forty eight shareholders. Funnily enough, yeah, minimum yeah. <laughs> net. <Yeah. laughs> uh, look, um, we've we've got a transaction at the moment. I, I say we because I, I I'm not involved at the coal face anymore with transactions uh, because I've built a team of directors around me that do the hard work. Thanks, Steve, Mike, Brad. <laughs> um, a transaction at the moment um, where. No one's in overall control because there's four shareholders and no one, uh, no one, it's about 25% each for argument's sake. And worse than that, in their shareholders agreement, they don't have a drag and tag clause. So that means, nice bit of technical, and uh, Govey will correct me, um, that someone has the ability to move minority shareholders forward on a, t a key decision like selling the business. Now, the problem with this is they've all got a reasonable chunk of money each, uh, a reasonable chunk of equity. And it's uh, currently it's a seven and a half million transaction pounds. Well, wow. okay. And it stumbled a couple of weeks ago for the sake of 50K. 
and it was one of the four shareholders that had a problem. They wanted another 50K extra, not a penny less. Yeah. It's it a seven and a half million transaction. It's a psychology, isn't it? It's a psychology oh. again. It's a psych- I, I want this. I've worked for this. <laughs> I want this. And, you, and j- talking about drag and tag, it's very important that, that you set that right. Now, here's a little secret for those of you watching this webinar is that if you don't have that particular clause in your shareholders agreement, the law says not only if you have 90% shareholders can force the rest, but to do that, you have to go to court. It's called compulsory drag and tag. So, and the drag and tag, you must have been a lawyer in your last life, Rob, is that it sets the percentage. So let's say you and I were shareholders and I was a 20% shareholder and you were an 80% shareholder. In your shareholders agreement, you would say that if you have those shareholders who hold at least 80% of the equity can force the sale. And I am what's called dragged with you. But going back to a pragmatic point, just because it's in there doesn't mean it's automatic because I could say, no, thank you, Rob. I don't want to do it. And I could just sit on my laurels. You again would have to sue me. And then what that does, of course, is it creates a challenge between you and I, and then you and I with the buyer and the buyer's going to say, no, thank you very much. Because if you two don't get on, I, I don't want to you hanging around, but it's, yeah, it just must be in there because it provides the right to do it. Yeah, and because and you think about the soft issues, if you don't reach an agreement, you still got to carry on working with each other. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds like Hades to me, where you've fallen out <laughs> over money and you still got to, you're still in ownership and working together. Yeah. So um, my top tip for this one, number five, is to speak with a solicitor, lawyer, speak with Govey, long before you put the company for sale. Um, not only to look at your shareholders agreement and articles, but look at your commercial contracts, you know, who you're doing business with, not, not just clients, but also suppliers. Also employment contracts, which I mean, I, I don't think you'd be surprised at this. I still find companies that don't have yeah. um, up to date employment contracts for their staff. They're yeah. well out of date. In fact, some of them still don't have employment contracts, employees. Incredible. The challenge, of course, and again, and you're probably going to get bored of me saying again, Rob, but it's, again, it's, it's the, well, we've, never, we've always done it this way. We've never needed to do it. <laughs> it's worked for us. It. It's worked for us. So, and, and of course, if, and it goes back to a, an element of control, because if you don't have them in place as sellers, the buyer will put them in place for you. Yeah. And you may not like that you have to be at your desk at nine o'clock in the morning because you said, Govey, I've done... 15 hour days for 20 years. I don't come in at nine o'clock in the morning. I might wander in at 11, but I'll be there at 11 at night. Now you're yeah. telling me, Govey, I only get an hour for lunch. So <laughs> it's, it's very, very important that whatever, t- two key points here, whatever has historically been in place should be written because you can then show the buyer's lawyers. They will undoubtedly, and again, going back, if I was on the buy side, my question to you, Rob, and your clients would be, okay, that's all very well. You're telling me that you three key managers have had two and a half hours for lunch, but where's the employment contract that says that? Well, yeah. we don't have one, Govey. Well, I'm going to report to the buyer and say, uh, there isn't something in place. It's difficult to work out whether or not it's, it's implied, as the law says, if you've always done it, that sets a precedent, or whether they just want two and a half hours in their future employment contracts. So then it gets back to, again, the psychology of, where do we stand on this? Yeah, so my top tip on that one is do yourself a favor. Um, go to Mackerel's and get a pre-due diligence exercise undertaken long before you actually put it on the market to sell. It Absolutely. will save you time, money, and heartache. Yes. Guarantee it. We at Mackerel's have got every single discipline you could, you could imagine. The only, the only sector that we haven't sold, but we do have a legal department, is cryptocurrency. So... If anybody watching is thinking about selling their cryptocurrency business, we'd be delighted to help you. Brilliant. Good. So I didn't know that. <laughs> I've locked that one away. <laughs> Mind you, don't get paid in cryptocurrencies. I, I would be... <laughs> yeah. When you're selling a business, make sure it's got the queen's head on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, that's just a personal view. It's not representative of advice or my company's advice. <laughs> Um, number six, deal break. I've left the best till last. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 
unrealistic sellers price aspiration and it's it's i've seen it for the last 20 years i've been in this wonderful industry and helping business owners move finish one chapter in their life and start a new one with cash uh, uh significant cash um is very few sellers owner managers have a realistic price in their mind and more than that um, when we sit down selling their business and we ask them very early on even before the coffee's been drunk in the first minutes um, what's your magic number and they invariably inv avoid that question it's quite interesting um, I su I've always suspected it's because they want us to value the business and then somehow if I come up with a big number or we come up with a big number, that, that, that's a done deal. And of course, I, we're not buying their company. So in a sense, it's irrelevant what we think it's worth or their accountant or their friend down the pub. Um, all that matters is the view of valuation from a real buyer with real money that has a strategic advantage to buy. So um, we, we spend a good two hours in a, an initial meeting with a prospective client understanding their aspirational price and another number which is lower which is their minimum walk away price the two are usually very different um not that we would ever advertise we don't advertise the price of any business that we uh, transaction that we sell because we let the market decide what it's worth the minimum walk away price is really important it's allied to the fifth deal breaker that we've just discussed because as shareholders if there's more than one shareholder you need to agree a minimum walkaway price between you and document it. That anything below that number, you really are not going to entertain as an offer. And that's really helpful for us as an intermediary to know that number. Not that we're going to sell it for that number. We need to know what we're negotiating with from you as our client. Um, I, I would say that we've achieved, and the number keeps going up as the years keep ticking on, but we've achieved over 40 percent on average more for our, than our clients aspirational price not their minimum walk away but their aspirational price so another 40 percent on top of that um, if we have someone a, a potential client got a silly figure in mind and they can't substantiate it i mean most clients you've you've come across this if it's a typical sme you know sort of typical size sme i mean um uh, and there's four shareholders I know, and I've done this for fun over the years, I've written down on a piece of paper that's hidden from them what I think they're going to come up with when I ask them how much they want for their business. And if there's four shareholders, they'll want four million. If there's three shareholders, they'll want three million. You, you can see where this is going, can't you? Two shareholders, two million. And if it's one shareholder of an SME, they want the magic million because it's cash. And I, I understand they don't want 974,000. <laughs> they, want, they always say a million. Always a million. <laughs> always a million. So uh, obviously it depends on the size of the business, but this is really common. Everyone wants to be a millionaire in cash. So, um, and that I, I, I have played with it over the years and said, is that net or gross? <laughs> tax. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, do we get taxed? Yes. <laughs> well, what's your accountant told you? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, key tip from me and i know you'll come you will have your own experiences of unrealistic sale prices um is as a as a sh as a shareholding team agree your minimum walk away price share it with your intermediary it's going to no negotiate and go into battle on your behalf um but we set our stall at the aspirational uh, more than the aspirational level and why do we do that is it because we're philanthropic well we are we are quite altruistic as a team of people but uh, no, because uh, we're on a 3% commission. So why wouldn't, we, why, why wouldn't we push it higher? And our average multiple, for those of you that understand multiples, and, and for those of you that don't, actually, it's a, you haven't come across it, a multiple is the number of years as a buyer and investor I'm prepared to wait before I break even on the money that I'm going to give to you to buy your shares. So um, on, on current profitability. So the higher the multiple, the bigger the price. And uh, our average multiple as a business over the last eight years now, I've seen the figures, is 
just a tad over 8.6. So wow. put it in layman's terms, which I understand, that's nearly nine years profit on a transaction. That is usually above most of our clients' aspirations, significantly above. And if we, if we do have a, business, a potential business seller that wants a number that really can't be substantiated, and we're good, and if we don't think we can get it, we just say, we, can't, we don't think we can get the number you're looking for. So you can either grow your business, and we can help you do that, or you've got to realign your price aspirations. Yeah, I think that's equally, I think, Rob, that's it. I think that's that's key and you've actually um we've talked about all the all the points that are on my list but price and aspiration is even more important in today's world because you, you know we can't shy away from from the pandemic and unfortunately it brings out um for want of better words the, the worst in potential buyers who will potentially use that as leverage to reduce your price and just because you are not getting all of it on completion doesn't mean you should turn it away. It just means you'll probably have to manage the credit risk a little bit better for waiting for your money. And the reason I say it's very important now is because despite all the media, despite that the market's pricing in X, Y, and Z, nobody truly knows what's going to happen to the economy over, over the next six months. You know, we've just, had, just been reading reports that the, our GDP dropped by 20%. For April. Mm. So you've got to always contextualize the reason that you're selling and the environment in which you're selling into. And that all, should always play a part of the psychology of selling. And actually, Rob, you've you've been through all the all the bits on my list, but the one that I, I think is particularly has been pertinent for me is property. Because as part of any sale, you may well have freehold on the balance sheet. And most buyers, particularly international buyers, they don't want to have it. They don't want it. Okay. So, and, and I'm, the reason I say that, another story is we're selling to an international uh, acquirer at the moment and they do not want the freehold. They've said, look, you can take it out, lease it back to us, but we do not want the freehold. It's not part of our strategy to hold property. And the reason that's important is because we have to set the mechanics on how to take it out of the company well in advance of any sale. Because if you miss time the steps, you want to avoid the revenue saying, hang on a second, you took property out of the company, we think that might be a dividend. So, and if you get, if you get tainted with that brush by the revenue, you've gone to 30 odd percent tax for taking the property out. But if you time it right and do it ahead of the sale and plan it, you can take it out as part of your sale proceeds. That's excellent advice, actually, Gavi. Excellent advice. Good. Um, so I've got one final sort of roundup because our, our hour is uh, is rapid, isn't it? Interesting. When when you're enjoying doing something, time flies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when 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 it's when you're doing something you really hate, time tends to go really slow. <laughs> Sunday afternoons, I find. <laughs> so a good sign about our relationship is time has just flown by. <laughs> So uh, one, one final roundup point from me, and this is based on 20 years experience of selling hundreds of businesses and, and my own transactions as well. Um, any business, and it's very relevant to COVID-19 and any, uh, and any recession, any business, any great business can be sold if it's in the hands of the right people. That means either us, Govy, the right accountant, um, every business is saleable at a good price. I don't mean at a discount. I mean a premium price if it's in the right hands. So get, get the right team around you to sell your business for you. Excellent. 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 Okay. Now, uh, well, I was going to say with the book, <laughs> um, I've given you the, uh, the Haynes manual of how to sell a business. So you don't even need to use evolution if you don't want to. I'm giving you. If you're going to go elsewhere, keep them accountable. Keep whoever you appoint to um, orchestrate the sale of your business. Keep them account to account using my book. Yeah. And uh, if, they're, if, if they're not doing the right things, then let's have a chat. Good. 
Good. I, I had some, um, I've been sent some question in, in advance that I'm going to answer, but do you have any, have you been sent any at all, Rob, that you'd like to answer? Uh, no, well, I, I, ha I had, and I've incorporated it into the various points. Okay, good. That, okay. Uh, that we've chatted through over the last uh, almost an hour now. So um, I've incorporated them in. Okay. But okay. Uh, it, it is worth saying, isn't it, that anyone that's got a question um, that they think of after this webinar, just get in touch with me or Govy, depending on whether it's legal, whether it's the M&A corporate finance side, and we'd, we'd happily uh, have an exchange and have a, a chat with you if yes. you've got a particular question. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I've got, I've got a question that was sent by one of the participants, is that okay. a lot of talk, uh, a lot of people talk about warranties and indemnities as part of any sale process. Um, and I've written down, what, what does that mean? Well, I'm not going to give away the secrets, otherwise you won't need to use me on a transaction. But what I will say is that when you come to sell, and if you don't use me on your sale, please contextualize the warranty it says price adjustment. So when you sell your company, your buyer will say to you, we expect you, dear seller, to give us these promises about the state and condition of your company. Now, if, if any of those promises are untrue and you haven't told us about them, then we'd like some money back, please. And, and you, quite rightly, Rob, talked about the Haynes Manual of Selling. So to contextualize that in car terms, if you, as buyer, you go and buy a car, you go and buy that Ferrari or whatever car you choose, and you buy the Ferrari for £90,000 on the basis that it's got 100 miles on the odometer, if when you take the Ferrari away, it actually had 100,000 miles on the clock, you'll take it back and you'll say, well, this isn't worth £90,000 it's worth £30,000, I'd like £60,000 back, please. Mm. And that's a, the context when you're selling your company. So uh, be very mindful of warranties. They can be a minefield, but they're nothing to be worried about. Indemnities are slightly different. And for those of you who are still on the webinar or are watching this afterwards, by all means, get in touch with me, govy.sandu at mackerel.com, and I can set out how indemnities work for you. Brilliant. Excellent. Uh, I, I think, well, I've had a good time. I think you have. And hopefully people <laughs> listening to this have, well, have a good time, but also learned something maybe and got some food for thought. Um, let's do another one. Um, maybe the uh, listeners and watchers of this could suggest another topic related well, I... around the selling of businesses, buying and selling of businesses. So we're, we're, it's interactive. We're happy to do another webinar um, that's on another topic. We'll so let us know. Ping us an email. The participants, drop us an email and we'd love to help. Wonderful. Wonderful. Take care, everybody. And thank you for sharing your time with us. Bye-bye. Cheerio. -bye.